Hi, I, I'm Richard Pastor. I am the director of the Oncology Center of Excellence at the FDA. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Jaffe. I'm a medical oncologist, and I'm the deputy director of the Human Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. Hi, uh, Eric Rubin. I'm a medical oncologist, and I oversee early clinical drug development for oncology at Merck. From a regulatory point of view, I think this uh, development of biomarkers, whether we're talking about uh, biomarkers for molecular aberrations or for the uh, immunological biomarkers, really uh, pose some regulatory challenges. Uh, because we weren't just developing a drug, we were developing a drug in combination with uh, a device. So this really required us to really work more closely with our colleagues in the center of uh, in the CDRH, uh, really to work as a team to really develop the biomarker uh, with the uh, drug. Uh, and I think this poses some essential issues here because uh, really even for pharmaceutical companies, they are in the business of developing drugs, but not necessarily in developing biomarkers. So. This was a period that required uh, a lot of discussion between not only what was happening here uh, in the FDA, but also what was happening within companies and their collaborations with the various uh, diagnostic and vitro diagnostic uh, companies. I think also, you know, probably the ultimate of this whole development of biomarkers was the tissue agnostic indications, which we've now approved. Uh, four of these, uh, and they really point to kind of redefining diseases in a sense. And, and I think it's important for us as uh, in medical oncology to really take a look at, is this going to be the future of oncology? And I think it will be. Dr. Pastor said it well. You know, I, I can remember many years ago when I was a, a fellow in oncology and some of the early discoveries were coming up about genes that when mutated caused cancer, so-called oncogenes that were present in multiple tumor types. And uh, there, was then, there were then efforts to target those mutations with, with drugs. You know, the idea, you know, was that, okay, if these are present in multiple tumor types, these drugs might be active across multiple tumor types and not just limited to, to one tumor type. And it's taken a few years to get to where that, that's become true. I, I think, uh, Maybe we'll talk about you know, some of the trial designs that are needed to address a tissue agnostic indication. But I, I think it's a, you know, it's, it's a culmination of efforts that relate to understanding cancer's origins. Uh, and as Dr. Pastor said, uh, developing um, um, paths that enable uh, an approval of a drug and an accompanying diagnostic. Um, and, and I think just an openness that, um, that, that innovative approach which is again very different than a, the classical way of developing drugs for a specific tumor type. It does require people to start thinking out of the box of where the future is going rather than to, uh, how should I say it, tenaciously cling to the past. Change is always difficult and uh, I think our staff in general though has basically uh, really uh, in, incorpor in, incorporated this into their thinking and really have embraced uh, the concept of tissue agnostic indications and really biomarkers. They make our job, and I've stated this on numerous occasions, much more easier. It's so much easier for us to approve a drug that has a 60, 70, 80% response rate than something that has a 10% response rate. And then we're arguing about the risk benefit relationship with that drug. Many times we were arguing, does the drug work and now we're many times asking how fast can we get this application out because it really provides an important opportunity for patients to have access to really important drugs and we want them to have important drugs. Change is hard in all different groups. We, we have our own uh, you know, uh, inabilities to change. But I think what, what is obvious to me and I've been doing drug development for 30 years now taking innovative concepts into uh, first in patient studies is that the FDA, industry, biotech, and academia have really come together. The FDA, in my mind, has really changed under Rick's guidance. Uh, they're really much more nimble and open and interactive and bringing us together. As Eric had said, you know, Rick called him and said, why aren't you doing this faster? 
I feel that on the academic level as well, we're able to move new concepts into patients as long as they're scientifically sound and the study designs are, are good. And the other piece of this is that the patient community has really been important in all of this. And I think, again, not everyone appreciated their role, you know, even 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, but they are a critical part of what we do. And it does have to be patient focused as we think about things. And that's what I tell my young faculty and trainees, you know, when you're designing your study, this has to be what patients want. We have to include patients. Yeah, I mean, I'll just comment. It is an interesting story. You know, I think a collaborative story, you know, with, with Merck and Hopkins and FDA, you know, so, so that, you know, as, as Dr. Jaffe mentioned, that that uh, we were approached several years ago now with the, the idea that um, first in colon cancer, because there were, there were some of the early work with, uh, with checkpoint inhibitors in just, you know, uh, the average colon cancer patient, there really wasn't much activity. But then there was the, the patient that uh, Dr. Jaffe mentioned where there was nice activity. And I think it was people from Bert Vogelstein's lab, Luis Diaz and others that hypothesized that certain types of colon cancer that were known to have defects in these DNA repair genes, mismatch repair genes, had very high mutation rates. And that these could re- result in what are called neoantigens. So these are abnormal proteins that can be recognized by the immune system and that that might make these patients good candidates for checkpoint inhibitors. And so it started off with a relatively small trial in colon cancer. And then, then the thought was, well, you know, it, it, there was good, good results there in these, in these um, what are called mismatch repair colon cancer patients, that why would this be limited to colon cancer? Um, and so the study expanded to, to other tumor types. We followed up with our own basket type study again, again, where we enrolled any patient who, was, um, who had this type of genetic defect. And I remember, again, uh, um, getting a call from Dr. Pazder because I think we had applied for, for breakthrough status um, uh, in, colon, in the mismatch repair colon cancer. And Dr. Pazder said, well, why are you, why are you just stopping with colon cancer? Um, why not consider uh, you know, a tissue agnostic one? And so I think Perhaps it, you know, we should have come to that earlier, but I think, again, it's back to where change is difficult, right? And, um, and, and so I think we were following more traditional tumor-based development paths, but of course, when, when we, we got the opportunity from Dr. Pastor, we, we, we pursued it with vigor. Uh, it's not about the patient, the clinical trial. The patients, I keep on telling people, the patients are not here to serve the clinical trial. The clinical trial is here to serve the patients that have cancer, okay? Uh, And people many times miss this issue uh, and wanna come back to the old way of thinking. We need two randomized studies uh, that show a survival advantage. And I, I think that's important from a regulatory point of view. And we have our own bureaucracy here that has to be moved. And that's been a 20 year job of mine to move that bureaucracy, but I'm sure Eric, if you'd like to comment, and Liz have the same issues with bureaucracies that exist in a university for Liz and in a large pharmaceutical company to move a bureaucracy to take risk, for example. Right. Well, I think it's the same thing. I mean, we're all, we're all trying to find, you know, better treatments for people with cancer. Um, you know, we're fortunate, I'm fortunate to have worked with a very active drug. Uh, um, and I, I think that, uh, um, you know, we're, we're of course looking for ways to accelerate having that drug approved. And again, I, I'm fortunate to, to have been part of that process at a time when there were lots of changes happening um, at the FDA under RIC. And I, but I also have to credit um, organizations like Friends of Cancer Research that, that really try to pull together, find commonalities and issues that can um, help to overcome some of the hurdles to getting drugs approved more quickly. If I may. Breakthrough therapy really helped me, okay, move the agency, okay? And and I think people forget this. There's a clinical portion to an application, but then there are multiple other factions of that or parts of that application, including chemistry manufacturing, which could be very problematic, okay, especially for very difficult and sophisticated drugs, clinical pharmacology, uh, statistics, toxicology people, And when something is designated as breakthrough therapy, it does bring together people in a sense of urgency. The other one that I I think, um, you know, was very helpful was um, 
the collaboration around around efforts that ultimately enabled the approval for the TMB t- tumor mutational burden high. And again, I'll you know I'll I'll credit Dr. Pazder for this because this was a natural follow on to the the MSI high approval. You know, we we knew that um, again much some much of this work done in, at Hopkins um, that uh, there were other ways to generate high mutation rates beyond just those that you would identify through an MSI high test. And so the idea was, that again, we're leaving patients behind if we don't study those patients as well, that, that those patients that ha- have tumors with high mutation rates that are different mechanisms than the MSI high. And so this was a natural idea, but um, it's a little more complicated than, uh, than MSI high because the Measuring tumor mutations is is much more complicated than than measuring a, 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 or declaring a deficiency in MSI in the in the mismatch repair systems, and so one of the one of the issues there was trying to gain alignment a, across the various companies, diagnostic companies, therapeutic companies, on if if you were going to pursue again a disease defined indication like TNB high, how would you define it? And in particular, with um, you know, with the with the tumor mutation burden rate, unlike the MSI test, this is one where it's you know what would be called a continuous test, right? You, there, there, there's a range of, of mutation numbers that can happen in a given patient, unlike just being either positive or negative for the MSI high. And so this created quite a bit of complexity. And it was again, I think, through efforts from FDA and friends to say to pull together the various. Um, stakeholders here to say, okay, let's let's get together and and settle on how we're going to define TNB high, and that actually happened, and was actually very important for us in enabling um, a proper study uh, of the TNB high population, and ultimately led to the approval. You know, we've talked about biomarkers, um, single biomarkers, but even thinking about um, mutation burden as a biomarker, we've had a number of um, examples where that doesn't fit all patients who respond to immunotherapy uh, and for many different reasons. And so how do we start to think about multiple biomarkers to identify the best patient population? Since cancer is complex, uh, as we try to move to cancers that don't naturally respond to single agent immunotherapy, it becomes even more important to think about this. Uh, It's not only going to be, well, I think, again, you saw that in melanoma with the BRAF and MEK inhibitors, right? Uh, So I think that's a perfect example of uh, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. If the drug works and you see superior response rates and superior activity with the combination of drugs and have a strong biological rationale, which that did, obviously, because you had two different inhibition of two different pathways, here again, it makes everybody's life easy, okay? Uh, it's much, I keep on saying to the, the reviewers, much easier to approve a drug with a 70% response rate than a 20% response rate. It's obvious here. I just want to throw one more point out here, and that is I worry because we're talking about patients who have good access to university hospitals. And that's a very small percentage of patients. and. I think as we're thinking about this, and I know we're all thinking about this, it's very important to think about it. We've thought about it before, even now, as we see how COVID is affecting uh, people who have less access to medical medical care at a higher rate. This has been the case for cancer as well. We really need to figure out as um, a society, as physicians, as people developing these drugs, how we get these drugs to underrepresented groups and study them early in those groups and give them good access to our therapies. Friends have really helped us tremendously in bringing uh, around the the companies uh, that have been measuring uh, TMB, and there's a wide variety of companies that were at the table, as well as the pharmaceutical sponsors, as well as the academics, as well as the patients. Uh, so it's a multi-stakeholder process, and I, I really congratulate friends on really bringing together this diverse community of stakeholders here. Uh, and I think that's the important uh, take-home point here. Yeah, there were there were several meetings I think that that um, that uh, occurred that enabled getting to sort of both. Um, you know, we alluded to this that. 
um, there are several tests that can measure tumor mutational burden, and some of those are more accessible in certain parts of the world than others. And so it, it was, it's also important to understand if you have a mutation rate of 10 on one test, how does that number relate to another test? Is it the same number? It's a different number because there are different ways to measure it. Um, and so, again, friends convened several meetings to try to understand how these assays perform. They, with discussion, led to test to, to I mean, to uh, um, experiments that, that, that were done to enable comparison across the, 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 uh, the various tests. And then also gathered information that was available from various companies that were, um, that with different drugs that had information and put it together, pooled it together and in sort of an anonymized way that allowed a nice discussion amongst the various, various stakeholders to try to get to what would be, um, you know, a meaningful determination of what's considered a, a, a high, a tumor mutation burden high um, cutoff. Well, since the onset of this pandemic in March, okay, we have been very active in contacting the patient advocacy communities, patients in general. We wanted patients to feel that they were not lost uh, in everything that is going on with COVID, okay? And that is not to diminish the efforts of the FDA in its work on developing vaccines and therapeutics for COVID. But we have been very active, not only in our outreach program, uh, with patients during this critical period of time, uh, but also in getting drugs out to people. We are here for you, okay? We are oncologists. We want to make sure that we have not forgotten our commitment to cancer. And that's the best thing I could do for all patients. They don't want false hope. They want hope that is based on reality, on science, on things that work. I have to agree with Rick. Um, it is a tough time for everybody, and in particular for cancer patients. I feel we, the community as a whole, all, all sectors are working doubly hard, maybe triply hard, uh, to make sure that we're getting drugs out to patients. We're, we're doing telemedicine. We've changed how we do business in the hospital setting and the clinic setting so that it is safe for patients to come back. And that's very important. I, I think that that, you know, the renaissance of, of immuno-oncology. I mean, it's, uh, Liz has been doing it for a long time, uh, um, uh, but uh, I, I think for many years there was a lot of skepticism and, and it wasn't until the checkpoint inhibitors came along where people realized these can be very active. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure it's the only route. Um, it looks promising. I mean, again, you know, it seems like we get better outcomes Every year, I mean, we start to see response rates in phase ones that, as you said, that are 50% or higher. Those never happened in the early days of my career. We're lucky if you got a single response. And now, you know, we're starting to see, you know, again, very high response rates, which I think will translate into, into improved longer-term outcomes.